to this tragically timely motion. Mr. Speaker, of course, my dear colleagues will look around the floor of the House and they will see that a good number of our colleagues are in black. And the reason we're in black is because the country mourns. Mr. Speaker, I shall take instructions from what the Leader of the House said. And he said that as we debate this motion, we should not debate this motion as people from any section of the, gov of the country, from any political party of the country, but that we should debate this motion as Nigerians who collectively mourn the death of our fellow citizens. Last week, somebody said to me, I lost one cousin in the just crisis. And I said to the person, I lost 216 cousins in the just crisis because they could have been my relatives. And so, Mr. Speaker, sir, you would agree with me that month in, month out, week in, week out, we have motions akin to this type of motion where we decry the senseless killings in our country and where we stand up and offer one minute silence. But I shall follow the instructions again of the Leader of the House. Please, honorable members, silence, please. Please, honorable members, should listen in silence, please. Thank you. And try to come up with what I have called the program of action. Mr. Speaker, there is a saying where I come from, that when two relatives go in to have a meeting, if they all come out laughing, then they have not spoken the truth to each other. And so today, Mr. Speaker, sir, I shall try to speak the truth on what I consider to be the program of action. And I have four subheads. But the first subhead, Mr. Speaker, sir, is what I call the Fulani silent majority. Mr. Speaker, in Benda, where I come from, for three generations at least, we have had Fulani headsmen who have lived with us in our communities, in peace, and have read their capital. I believe that that is the same Fulani that Mr. President referred to when he said that Fulani are known to walk around with their cattle peacefully carrying sticks. Mr. Speaker, those are the Fulani that all of us know and have known in our communities. But Mr. Speaker, there is also the Fulani that on the Global Terrorism Index, is named as the fourth most deadly terrorist organization. There is also is the peaceful, silent majority of Fulani that have lived in all our communities, the ones that Mr. President referred to as the Fulani who go around with sticks and who just want to herd their cattle. But there is, unfortunately, Mr. Speaker, sir, the Fulani who belong to number four, who was named as number four as the most dangerous terrorist group in the Global Terrorism Index, who operates within West Africa, who from 2001 to 2018 have killed 60,000 people, who since the beginning of this year have killed 1,917 people, who according to the body of the motion have sacked and occupied 53 villages. Mr. Speaker, sir, to my brothers who are the Fulani, the peace-loving Fulani, I ask them that the time has come to name and shame them, that the time has come for them to call them what they are and differentiate between those ones and these ones, so that as Nigerians who have always lived in peace and harmony, we can continue to live in peace and harmony with our Fulani brothers. Mr. Speaker, sir, the second one is to the United Nations. I call on the United Nations, and I thank the Secretary General of the United Nations, Wataras, for speaking about the killings in Nigeria. But I also agree with what he has said, that it is a toxic incendiary mix of climate change, resource control, tribal, ethnic, religious, as well as sheer criminality. And they accuse the Nigerian government of verbal condemnation. But the United Nations also 
is guilty of verbal condemnation. When 53 people, when 53 villages have been wiped out, Mr. Speaker, sir, it starts to make the word clash pale in comparison to what it is that is going on. We start to ask ourselves the question, does it have genocidal tendencies? Mr. Speaker, if it seems like genocide, if it tastes like genocide, if it walks like genocide, Mr. Speaker, sir, it is genocide. And therefore, for over 60 years ago, the United Nations came up with a treaty, the Anti-Genocide Treaty. If Nigeria, as well as all these countries, are signatories to this convention, then I think that it is time for the United Nations to call it what it is and start to activate it. It is very reminiscent of what happened in Rwanda, when for over two months the United Nations was debating the definition of genocide while the killings carried on abated. I believe that if the world has started to notice that one of the strongest, most populous countries in the world is on the brink, then we must realize that should anything happen to Nigeria, the entire sub-region, region, and indeed the world will be shaken by this. I believe at this time, the third one is to the government. And I speak to the president and the commander-in-chief of the armed forces when I say to him, Mr. President, the box stops on your table. This morning, I had the very unfortunate displeasure of listening to Femi Adeshina as he spoke about this issue. And I saw insensitivity at a time when he should have been very sensitive. I saw him when they asked him about ancestral land. He said, it is better to live on top than in the ground. I found him extremely insensitive. This is the spokesman of a country that is mourning. Mr. Speaker, sir, I have heard the narrative coming out of government. Government has said to us that the people who are perpetrating these crimes are not Nigerians. And yet, in the same breath, government says to us to open up and live with them. Mr. Speaker, if they are not Nigerians and they're invading our land, then it means that we're opening up our land to foreign militia. It is war, Mr. Pre Mr. Speaker. You cannot ask us to live with people in one breath and tell us that these people are not Nigerians. At the end of the Civil War, government had deliberate policies for integration. What were those deliberate policies? NYSC, federal schools, so that there would be integration and the children would grow up knowing that we were one country. I do not see any direct integration policies except to say, live in peace. Mr. Speaker, I do not believe that that is the way to go. In the words of John Fitzgerald Kennedy, he said, man must put an end to war or war will put an end to man. That is our responsibility as government. Mr. Speaker, Babandede has to wake up to his responsibilities. If indeed these people are not Nigerians, then let us check the borders, let us check the porous nature, let us come up with serious programs of action against the proliferation of small arms and light weapons. Mr. Speaker, my colleagues have spoken about the security chiefs. I must lend my voice to that. Mr. Speaker, Finally, my program of action is to us as citizens of Nigeria. I would ask that all of us go and watch two movies, Hotel Rwanda and One Night in April. Nigeria dances very dangerously on the brink. Then in Rwanda, it was the radio that made them dehumanize people. Now it is our telephones and social media. Social media cost the Arab Springs. Mr. Speaker, sir, we have taken to passing around stories, images that will never heal this country. I know that it is very painful, but let me say that over 80% of the users of social media are below the age of 80, of 30. 35% of that number are below the age of 18. Mr. Speaker, even if we were to stop the killing today, hatred, suspicion, divisiveness is etched into the DNA of the next generation. It will take this country at least 40 years for us to start to look at ourselves in the way that we did. I would ask 
that mainstream media should please have responsible reportage. And as we send these pictures around, we should make sure it is true. We should make sure it doesn't fan the embers of hatred. We should make sure that as much as possible as citizens, we do not suffer from the tragedy of the incomplete narrative. I know that even though 200 people were killed in Joss, another 250 were saved by that imam. When we tell those stories, we should tell them together. I would ask, therefore, my dear colleagues, that yes, one minute silence is not enough. And I hope that as I have given this, that my other colleagues would add to what it is we have done, because this is not a time for blame games. This is not a time for passing the buck. This is the time for us to realize that our country is bleeding and our country needs to heal. Thank you.